All right, for this week's episode of Whitetail Cribs, we are going to the land of giants. We're talking Iowa. This is back from our summer trip, and we visited with Scott Siebel, who is a partner of Fat Rack Outfitters. And you get to check out basically a penthouse of some of the most incredible animals we've seen from Africa to Iowa, giant deer. We hope you guys enjoy it. Here we go. Hey guys, how we doing? I'd like to come on in, I'll show you kind of what we've got going here. It's a little different than most lodges or whatever. We've moved to town and we've got an apartment complex and we use this for kind of our lodge for when hunters come. Welcome to our, I guess you'd call it a penthouse. It's the third floor of our complex, and this is kind of some of the stuff that I'm Scott Siebold, and this is some of my hunting life. So I'll show you what we have. This area here is some of my favorite white tails, I guess you would say, that we've been able to do and be a part of. And a lot of it's archery, but some of it is muzzleloader, some of it is shotgun. Just part of our life and an enjoyment. This wall here has been, it's not my biggest deer, but it's probably some of my biggest memories. This was my first deer ever in the 170s. It was um, a Missouri uh, rifle hunt and quite a day that day. I guess it was two days. It was below zero. Snow, snow, didn't see anything for two days. The snow finally stopped on a Sunday afternoon and at a long range we seen this guy walking up. Good thing it was in Missouri, it was a rifle hunt. It's the only deer we've seen in two days, but uh, was able to be successful and that was my first deer in 170, I guess you would say. And uh, this is actually my last gun deer that I had shot and he's in the 70s, but uh, Different farms, different places, but this deer and what we call the drinking mount, I had just had neck surgery. And um, I literally had been done with my neck surgery for three days. My son was hunting with me and uh, we'd had a lot of pictures of this deer. I was trying hard to get on him, we tried and tried and actually it gave up, it was on our way home. And uh, he seen him off um, in the snow, scratching for some uh, some food in the winter there in muzzleloader season. We put a spot and stock on him, was nowhere close to where we thought he would be. But uh, it's kind of unique how they'll go wherever they got to go for food in muzzleloader season. So that's where he came from. This was my first bow hunt to be over 170. Uh, not necessarily the greatest deer in the world, but at the time I thought he was a absolute giant. It, uh, I had set a hundred sets before I pulled that bow back, um, which it would have been 50 days probably, but I'd went 50 in the morning and 50 in the evening, rain, snow, whatever, but I had set a hundred sets before I pulled my bow back on that. The deer I was after, uh, I had never got him. I had his shed several years, had him at 25 yards, couldn't get it done. All I had was his head and he backed out. So then finally, he had came by and was able to get that down there. But as some of the people will tell you that they're always right there, you should be able to go kill them a hundred sets before I ever pulled a bow back. So it takes time. It definitely does. And it's kind of my stress relief at that time. This was um, a deer, a, a public hunting deer that with a bow. It's pretty neat. I took my hunters out and we were coming home and I seen him running a scrape line and public hunting and I was able to put a spot and stock on him and uh, that was kind of a neat thing to try to do, put a spot and stock on public hunting and was able to get that done. And as I tell people, I don't know and sure it's probably not the same deer, but four years before a friend of mine and I caught, there was a little buck hung in the fence, literally 200 yards from where we shot that deer and we untangled him out of the fence and he ran away and we said, 
go get bigger and we'll come back in time. Four years later, we came back by, probably wasn't the same deer, but I like to feel like it might have been. So that's, call it crazy or whatever, but it just might feel like it might have been. But it was a neat feeling that we had when we came back by there. So it was neat. This deer actually came from one of our properties that uh, we do an outfitting several years back. He was um, a deer that we thought we was gonna lose. Put a shot on him that necessarily I thought was a good shot, wasn't good. Tracked him, the blood ran out, started snowing, nothing, and then wound up finally finding him later. Um, he crawled back up underneath an evergreen tree. We was able to find him there, but still not a booner. And I was always wanting a booner I only have one in this place that's mine. I have one that's my partner's, but I uh, only have one that's mine. But beautiful deer, blessed to be able to get it, but he wasn't a Boone and Crockett, so I was still always hungering for that Booner. I mean, we've got, uh, you know, a 170 with a bunch of drops, which is a nice, wonderful deer, unique. But in my mind, I wanted to have that Boone and Crockett and hadn't been able to get it, but... As we go through the house, I've been able to do a lot. I mean, I've been able to go to Africa 10 times and do the big five with my bow and arrow. Been able to do six of the seven of the dangerous seven. Uh, some friends that I have in that part of uh, the world that someday they hope to be able to come actually do a whitetail hunt, but we don't know how that would work coming from a different country. So it's not the same as going there, but fun part, fun part of being able to do in my archery. This is a Eisenhower uh, sable, just uh, another one of my dreams, if you would, I uh, was able to get, and you get that done. This uh, zebra, this actually became the bait for my lion hunt. And a lot of people don't think about a zebra, but the best red meat I've ever ate is a zebra. I've, I've not been a real red meat fan, my whole life and I was eating that steak and said what in the world is this this is great so that's the zebra you shot yesterday and it was phenomenal it was this here they call that black death that was a, an archery sh shot there in Pongola Africa it was probably uh, started my bug for my black my big five and I didn't think I was ever going to all I wanted to do was to go to Africa one time and shoot an impala and uh, a kudu. Well, that, as you can see, that got way more extent than that. But he was coming into a water hole where I was sitting and he kept coming and we finally was able to get the license for it. And we got it shot, but it was on the day that we was getting ready, the night before we was getting ready to go home. I only got it one lung. We tracked it till dark, didn't get it found. We had a helicopter come in and because everybody was going to the airport and we flew and flew and finally spotted it, got it found so the uh, natives could get it, round it up for us. And once they had it, they took me the helicopter to Johannesburg to get on the airplane to come back home and then they shipped it home. But that started my mess of my big five and, and we ran into Went into a lion, this big male lion uh, was an archery kill. It, um, this one, we, they called him Trouble. He was attacking people, he was killing their animals. My friend called me, said, if you don't get here, we're gonna have to destroy him, but if you want it, get here. We went and got it done. It um, was ridiculously exciting because he was hunting people. We had, we didn't want to shoot any other ones. We'd made the bait, and there were three other lions on the bait, and it wasn't him. He had snuck up behind us, tried to get us. We turned around, started sneaking up on him. He disappeared. We went back behind our tree where we were, not in a blind, just behind a tree. He came out, coming straight at me. And my buddy behind me said, you cannot shoot him with a bow while he's facing you. And so okay, well he kept coming and coming and coming and I was ready to pull draw back. At nine yards I was able to shoot him and it was uh, with a rage extreme and we was able to take the heart and part of his lungs out and he did vaporize quite quickly but the worst thing, when he's laying there dead in front of you, what do you think the other three 
that was on the bait decided to do. They wanted to come see what trouble was doing. We're on the phone telling our friends, get in here, get in here, get in here. Made it really exciting. And the night before, I had laid my face open, and I had to keep icing my eye open. And uh, it was just an experience that, again, became just something that, as you get old, I can sit and everybody will think I'm senile, but probably am. Who knows? Who knows? But these animals are just all part of Africa. I love South Africa. Got my kudu. This is a water buck. This is a black wildebeest. This is an oryx gims book, buck. People say, why did you shoot the babies? This is part of a tiny tin. This is a very old red diker. Uh, very old. The little ones, they're the appetizers for these animals most of the time. This is a mountain reed buck. That's a common reed buck. And then as this is an eland, and when I shot the eland, it was in this female line was in the area, and I always thought it would be neat to kind of make into where she was at least jumping on the back of it. I like some action things, so we was able to do that. This is our blue wildebeest. In my leopard hunt, I was able to get in Namibia from uh, really good friends of ours over there. Um, we hunted that very, very hard. It spent 20 days over there, putting bait out all day long, setting cameras back and forth, trying to get them to come on. We was able to be successful in, in one hunt. Now, this little steam buck, this is their basically like our cookies. I like cookies. They like steam bucks. And there's just a little snack for them. But we thought we would incorporate that in part of that mount as part of the memories there also. This is a uh, um, blue diker. And I would like to get all of the tiny tin. I have seven of them. But I have to travel some other places. And we can't travel right now to get the rest of the tiny tin. That's a bush buck there. He's part of the spiral horns from South Africa, able to have all the spirals, um, which you have your kudu, your bush buck, and the elan, and then you have the uh, inyala, which we have it over here. This is my crocodile I was able to do with the bow. It, um, they're different than an alligator. A croc has a smaller head, but a lot bigger throat. The teeth are smaller on a croc than they are and an alligator, but their throat, like I said, opens up to swallow way bigger things. And they say, how do you shoot that with a bow? Well, if you do studies, if you shoot them in the body, they will keep coming for air. And um, was able to get that done there. He's not a giant as there is there in some place in South Africa, he's 12 foot. And if you ever see a crocodile in the water, what you see out of the water from his eyes to his nose, he's 12 inches. And usually that's how many feet they are, it's in the inches. So that's not an alligator, but it is in a croc when it is that way. So that was kind of part of our Africa thing. These are our zebras. That This is a mountain zebra rug, and that's a common zebra, different ones that we'd have, and just kind of the decor of our home. Uh, this is our main showroom, if you would, of the, our lodge for Fat Racks, where we do our outfitting and our our people who come they eat right here at the bar with us family and we have sheds up on the bar from some of the, our hunts that we will do my ibexes this came from russia this is probably one of the most memorable hunts uh, for culture i learned that the people from russia are tough people survivors um, very much survivors. Uh, we were at 14,000 feet. This was a friend of mine and I went to this hunt. Very exciting, very fun. Was able to get it done. Uh, it was a gun hunt, but it uh, was in Kazakhstan, Russia. We had good guides. And also, this is the same camp that uh, a lot of the guys on TV shows go to. SCI hunt was able to get this done. And it was memorable. I, I, that's a Spanish Ibex up above. Uh, he came from Spain. We was able to go see the castles and stuff there. And it was a great uh, trip, even on its own. And I had been able to go to uh, New Zealand. Uh, this is just an alpine buck. But he was, uh, at the time, my goatee was way longer than it is now. And they were teasing me. And they said that uh, we had to do that because we had the same goatee, he said. So... But when we did it, I was able to do this red stag. It was a wild one. It was a free range. 
Uh, there's a lot bigger ones out there, but I was really happy to be able to get that taken care of at the time. And we was focused hard on this fallow deer. Um, we hunted it almost the whole hunt we were there. Uh, at, at this time, back in, um, I guess it would have been probably 2010, it was number five in the world with the bow. Uh, and it was um, pouring down rain the day that we finally got that done. We stocked that uh, rascal for eight hours in the rain with the bow. And we took our clothes and wrung them out multiple times. But right at dark, we was able to get that finished. And there was a, another great memory that we can have as far as in hunting. It was part of our lodge and part of what we do here. Uh, my only elk hunt we went with a bow. A friend of mine, uh, Jeff Myers, was my guide, and the mountains wasn't very good to my system, uh, but we was able to get him out of the way. Otherwise, we went over to Alaska. We was able to do a doll sheep from a friend of mine, Rick Stickle, there. We was up horsebacked in from the Denali Park, and uh, another friend that who was a cook there and um, a guide also that he'd been there for 20 years at the time and with the same group of uh, different years I was able to get my moose uh, there. I, there they had a minimum of it had to be at least 60 inches or four points on one bottom. We knew he didn't have the four but at the time it was 900 yards away we had to try to judge if it was big enough and um, we got as close as we could to be able to get them, but then the work really started once they drop. The nice thing I liked about Alaska is nothing can, can come out trophy-wise until all the meat does. And so there's a lot of meat that's got to come out of there. And uh, some of our, <laughs> this was my first turkey mount here, and we've got a big one over there and the other, but it doesn't look like much, but it was, um, I was proud of them at the time. Okay, and that was with a bow also. This is my caribou uh, was able to get there also by Denali. Uh, I love the velvet. Some people want to know why I didn't scrape it all off, but for me, again, it's all about what you like. And I love the velvet, so I ran it to a taxidermist and we filled it full of formaldehyde to where it would all stay on, and um, I just love the velvet. It, uh, I'd like to get a white tail in the velvet someday. Uh, I guess I do have back in one room. It came from Montana, but uh, I forgot about that. I'm losing my mind, I guess you'd say. <laughs> but. And as you go down the hall, these are just bedrooms, if we would, that we try to place for them to, to come and to stay, different sheds and stuff if we would. But then my first deer I ever had mounted, I gotta show it to you. Everybody thinks you have giants all the time. Not really, I mean, you look at this deer and you'll think it was nothing, but I still remember that it was 40 years ago. No, it was more than that, my goodness. Probably almost 50 years ago now. But that was my first deer I ever had mounted. He was, he sent 12 deer out first. I would see him hitting them and send them. And when he came, he scored 146 inches. But I still remember that just like it was yesterday. So that's kind of part of what hunting is, is the memories in your life and to share. And now I don't necessarily like to hunt whitetails as much as we used to. I love put, putting people on them. And as I share with people, I've been able to watch several grown men cry because they're able to get a really nice deer. And now that is part of giving back of what it has given me to do. So the Lord has blessed us beyond measure. And so now I feel it is our job to try to bless somebody else with part of God's creation also. So if uh, you ever get a chance to draw a tag, we're here at Fat Racks. This is kind of our lodge. This is our life. We'd love to see you.